All right, so good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this talk is not a technical talk. You're not going to learn lots of technical stuff about Cloud Foundry. So um, if you're expecting difficult things, uh, uh, you're going to learn that it's not actually that difficult. Probably is the main topic of the, of the talk. So do you know the Cloud Foundry Foundation, of course? Uh, this beautiful entity that actually allows us to use Cloud Foundry for free uh, to work around the services, to create products, to um, actually live and somehow um, struggle with Cloud Foundry a little bit. So from if you take a, um, a quick approach on this and you identify um, the companies that actually are part of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, you will see that uh, twenty six percent of those companies appears in the global fortune five hundred ranking, so it means that twenty six percent of the companies that belongs to the uh, that forms the cloud funding foundation they have quite a huge amount of money, huge amount of incomes, and you 're probably identifying them as uh, big really big companies actually they are so um, the problem is that if you take a look at num uh, the number of companies around the world, this is an estimated number, of course, there is almost no way to know exactly how many companies are around the world, um, you will see that that Fortune 500 is only the 0.0002% of the companies that are, are in, in the world. So the rest, probably the rest of us, uh, belongs to the 99.998 percent. Okay, so before going forward, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Juan Pablo. Uh, I am from Argentina. I live in Buenos Aires. Uh, in the community, uh, they know me mostly as uh, for my initials, JP. It's easier than Juan Pablo, so uh, if anyone calls me JP, that's just perfect. Um, I have been working in IT for 19, for 19 years, uh, since I was 17. Um, I have worked with S390, yes, COBOL, yes. Um, I like uh, dancing tango, I teach tango, um, I play guitar, I sing. Uh, I, I love working with Cloud Foundry, enabling companies to uh, this new cloud world, this new cloud native world. Um, please stay in touch if you want to follow me on Twitter. I don't tweet that much, but when I tweet, it's not important, but maybe interesting. Um, or you can add me at, in LinkedIn. Uh, I stay there a, a little bit much that in, in, in Twitter. Um, moving forward. So probably you're going to see this picture, right? Uh, you identify the monsters. This is uh, a Clover from Cloverfield. And here we have Chucky, right? So it's a scale of monsters. Uh, if we take a look, if we put it in perspective, this is the 0.0002%, right? If you identify a small, medium business, if you have a small, medium business, probably you're going to be like here, between you're going to be working really hard to have your product done between Chucky and uh, the depressed T-Rex because he cannot reach the beer, right? You're probably going to be around there. A small medium business has very specific limitations. A system is defined by its limitations. So a small medium business, you want to uh, have a product as fast as possible in the streets. You want to have that product, you want to have that um, application running so your potential customers or your, even your, your, your customers can start trying it, can start building things with it, can start, uh, start uh, saying, okay, so this product is really good. Uh, you want to start getting revenue as fast as possible as well because your money is limited. I don't know if you're going to have like startup uh, um, funding or not, probably not. If you're a self-funded uh, company, your budget is going to be really limited. So. Um, you have to have a very, very fast feature to cycle, uh, feature to production cycle. I mean, you have to be uh, very quick to adapt, very quick to fix, very quick. Um, you have to spend your money very smartly, uh, your time too, and, and of course, time is money. Um, 
a small medium business has uh, these uh, characteristics, right? Um, and this, the last one, is probably one of the most important of all. Stay small until you can't. Growing is extremely easy. I mean, everybody can hire people, everybody can uh, build more infrastructure, everybody can uh, build, uh, buy services, stay small until you can't. Downsizing is the problem. So this is the main feature, stay in budget. A small, medium business stay in budget, right? How can Cloud Foundry help with this? Cloud Foundry uh, actually puts developer first. The only thing that the developers has to do is focus in developing the product that you are building, okay? Uh, you can focus on your ideas, you can focus on your business development, you don't have to worry about infrastructure, you just worry about how your product can make an impact. Uh, it has this beautiful way of forcing um, good practices in cloud native environments, 12 factor apps. If you're not familiar with the 12 factor apps, you should take a look. There's a very beautiful website. You can uh, uh, take a look at it. If not, um, uh, please uh, ask me. I will happy to, to, um, to guide you through them. Um, Cloud Foundry provides a really, really easy, uh, really fast way to um, provide a product feedback cycle. You can uh, push applications so easily to Cloud Foundry, they can be up and running in seconds. So uh, you're actually, uh, the stakeholders uh, are going to be up to date with the product. And uh, even you, if you're uh, like working yourself only, uh, you will be able to see your application up and running very easily. Um, Cloud Foundry is ideally is coupled with a continuous integration software, whatever likes you want. We in the community will love Concourse, as you probably have seen, but if you use Jenkins, that's just perfect. If you use uh, any other CI software, that's just all right. So if you use a CI uh, system plus a good test suite, you are done. That's a really killer combination. Uh, Cloud Foundry is quite secure and stable. You can have, uh, I mean, in our company, we have had uh, really a big and small Cloud Foundry deployment in our customers for a long time without any single problem, no uh, VM down, everything working perfectly. Um, and this is one of my favorite parts, the community. Community is amazing. Uh, dev list, uh, the uh, uh, mailing list, the Cloud Foundry Slack channel, all the releases, uh, security fixes, everything is provided by the community and the community is absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, so let's say that you are a very small business and you have a very small budget, right? So like, I mean, in the range of maybe you can spend 100, 200 bucks per month, no problem, you can still use Cloud Foundry uh, using one of the public offerings uh, out there. You have Pivotal Web Services, you have Swisscom, IBM Bluemix, Centralink, NTT, uh, Ancora, Predix. You have your choices. You can choose one of them and start basically uh, with this almost for free. You can actually start for free using Cloud Foundry. You don't have to pay anything. I don't care if you're using uh, open source or one of these public offerings you're using Cloud Foundry that makes the community grow and makes the community even great than what it is actually. Uh, but if you have enough budget, I seriously recommend to go with open source, right? Uh, I am a huge proponent of open source. I love open source. So if you want to use open source, it's better. Um, the problem is that this might be somehow familiar for you, so you do a Bosch deploy, it doesn't work. Why? Then you do a Bosch deploy, and it works. Why? Um, <laughs> I think that's, 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 that's quite, that, that's hap it happens to you a lot, right? It's like, why, why, why? All right, so in this case, companies like us, like Altoros, uh, that's when we come to help. Um, we in Altoros, we have been part of the CF Foundation uh, from the very beginning. 
We have lots of experience with Cloud Foundry. We are vendor agnostic. We don't um, uh, sell any kind of distribution, whatever. We just provide services around Cloud Foundry. Uh, these are some, more, some of our customers. We, new customers are actually coming to us uh, uh, every day. We provide services from integration to trainings, uh, from creating service brokers, build packs, whatever you need around Cloud Foundry. Um, and yes, we are uh, sponsors, gold sponsors. So we are very, very proud of it. Okay, enough with the commercial pitch. Um, so what are we aiming at with this presentation? What I'm going to uh, try to uh, uh, do is to have a Cloud Foundry deployment uh, that is good for development, that is good for testing and demoing applications, uh, that is suitable for very light production use, okay? Internal applications uh, and, and first stages of the product release, like alphas and betas. This is not going to be like real heavy, heavy production usage, but uh, it can work for the first stage of uh, releasing applications or even using internal applications. Um, it has to be very easy to manage. Very easy to manage is uh, basically upgrading and disaster recovery and uh, uses the best possible resources in your infrastructure as a service. Um, of course, cost the less possible amount of money. We are cheap. We don't have that much money, so we have to uh, 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 shrink down the deployment. Um, has some HA, in this case, self-healing. It will have self-healing. We will have that functionality working. But this is what we are not going to have, and this is actually why it's not suitable for large production usage. Uh, we are not going to have redundancy. This a part of HA that is very important. We are not going to have it. And we are not going to have true load balancing. Okay, so these are the limits of the system. This is what we are aiming at. Having this in mind, we have some options, right? If you don't have um, your um, uh, internal data center that you may use VMware or OpenStack, you have these three options out of the box with Bosch. You can deploy a Cloud Foundry with Bosch in one of these three options. You have Amazon Web Services, you have Microsoft Azure, and you have Google Cloud Platform. For the sake of simplicity, and that probably every one of us here played with AWS at some point, um, I choose um, Amazon Web Services for this like uh, theorem or however you want to call it. Um, and because it's actually it's very widely used. Uh, to deploy Cloud Foundry, actually, you have many different ways. But uh, the preferred way in the community is using Bosch. Actually, you have the uh, new releases are uh, prepared for Bosch. Uh, you can uh, upgrade Cloud Foundry very easily using Bosch. So you have two flavors. You have full Bosch. That's why it's in uh, bold, uh, bold uh, typeface. And you have micro Bosch. The two differences between one of them is that Bosch uh, is uh, highly distributed. It uses many different uh, virtual machines. And Micro Bosch is only one virtual machine, right? So, uh, and since we are trying to shrink everything, uh, we are going to use Micro Bosch. So you have a killer combo that actually Dumbledore is very happy with that you use uh, Amazon Web Services, Micro Bosch, and open source Cloud Foundry. Um, the problem is that when you deploy um, a Cloud Foundry uh, in Amazon, uh, the size of it can be quite shocking because you have MicroBosch, only one instance. Cloud Foundry takes 18 VMs, 18 VMs, one per each process, right? Um, at at that, you have to uh, um, some, you know, some assorted AWS services like uh, Elastic IPs and and, and whatnot. Uh, this so, this sums the, uh, about one uh, thirteen hundred USD per month. <laughs> yeah, Power Ranges are not really happy with this. Um, so that can be. Uh, a, a quite high number. Okay, so this is uh, per hour usage. Okay, you can save money if you 
higher uh, if you pay up front. But let's say that we don't uh, want to pay up front because we don't know if our business is going uh, to be successful. So we want to go, you know, month by month. Um, the deployment. The deployment is going to have lots of different processes. Each one of these uh, little boxes is one VM, right? So you have console, HA proxy, NAT, CD, stats, NFS, blobs, or UA. You have all the different components of a Cloud Foundry deployment, one per VM. That's highly costly. So we have to start trimming this. How do we do it? We start by using the right resources in our infrastructure as a service. So the blob store, we can easily replace it with, with S3. And S3 doesn't have a, um, a fixed cost. It's pay by usage. So if you use a very low amount of uh, S3, you're going to have a very uh, low bill in it. HA proxy can be replaced with Elastic Load Balancer very easily. That's not a huge problem. Postgres can be replaced with RDS, right? And then you have three processes that are not essential for Cloud Foundry. That's the Clock Global, the Stats, and FS. Those three can go. Um, just like that. It's not much a problem. Then you have, this is the new layout of your deployment. How is it going to look? Okay, so we have these processes. As we still have a, like a, lots of VMs that are going to be up and running all the time, uh, like 11. So how we, we keep thinking how how can we shrink this even more, even more, right? Uh, this is where Bosch comes uh, to our rescue. Bosch has this fantastic feature that's called job collocation. So you can uh, actually put uh, uh, two or three different jobs in one VM, right? If you configure it correctly, it's not a small task, but you can do it. Um, so we can put uh, two or three different jobs in each one of the VMs. The important thing is identifying the roommates, right? Who can live with uh, another process, and that's the uh, kind of the, the, the key to the question. So the important process here is the runner. The runner, the runner is where your applications are going to be living. It's where the containers are created, are destroyed. When you push your application, where you restage your application, that's going to happen in the runner. So the runner has to be left alone. He likes to live alone. No, nobody uh, uh, bothering him. The runner is, uh, is kind of antisocial, right? So then you have other processes that actually likes living together because, for example, NATS is network intensive, uh, but the API and the API worker, not so much. It's not that many, there's, they're not uh, network intensive. And you have the router that is network intensive and it's also process intensive. So these can actually live together they will compensate. Then uh, you have, for example, the UAA and the, and the health manager. Uh, as you notice, this is a, a regular Cloud Foundry uh, without Diego, right? I, I wanted to simplify this. It's, this is without Diego running. Um, you have the UAA and the health manager. Um, this can be another VM, right? Uh, the UAA, uh, in a development environment where uh, many, uh, where you have uh, a small team of developers, it's not right, going to be very intensive. And the health manager also is not going to have lots of, um, uh, of jobs uh, running because uh, there are not going to be so many containers. And then you have what I like to uh, call the log uh, VM uh, that has Logregator, Doppler, and the traffic controller all together. This is very network intensive uh, VM. You, we can size it, we will size it later, but all of three, all of these three can live together in one VM. And of course, you got console and etcd. And the thing with console and etcd is that etcd is very disk intensive. It's very disk intensive. Etcd is writing to the disk constantly. 
In fact, uh, for one of our customers, we had to uh, make etcd write to a RAM disk because it was killing, actually, the disks. That's something that can happen, so have it in mind. Uh, console is not that uh, disk intensive. Console is for server discovery and, 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 and keeping some secrets. That's okay, that's good. Uh, it's not really uh, intensive, so they can coexist. So right now we have reduced those 18 VMs to four or five, actually with the runner being on one VM. Uh, this is actually very nice, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to size it. And this is the very, this is one of the key parts of this exercise. Um, the first VM, uh, let's put it in a C4. Why C4? C4 is uh, AWS category, uh, actually C is um, AWS category for processor intensive virtual machines. This will um, also, C4 has enhanced, enhanced network capabilities. So uh, the VM1 that has uh, two processes that are uh, processor intensive and network intensive will have enough room to work with the API and the API worker. Then you have uh, the VM2, that is UAA and, Ho and the uh, uh, health manager, you can easily fit it into an M3 medium. That is not really expensive uh, machine. Actually, uh, if you take the manifest from uh, default Cloud Foundry deployment, and you take a look at the um, uh, Bosch manifest and all the machines, like basically an 80% of them are M3 medium uh, with a couple of larges there. Um, then uh, you have the logregator um, uh, machine that is also a C4. Why? Because they are mostly processor intensive and uh, C4 has uh, enhanced networking capabilities. And then you have the VM4, that's an M3 medium. You don't have to uh, have lots of processing power there. And um, for the runner, we leave it alone. We have an M4 large. Okay, so M4 large, it only has eight gigabytes of memory. That's about 16 containers running without any issue. Um, but for a small, medium business, 16 containers is okay. It's not uh, a small, medium business. Maybe you can have like, what? eight instances of your application running uh, according to different environments. Uh, that's okay, it's not, uh, it's not that much. I mean, we're talking, to, uh, we're talking about small and medium businesses. We're not talking about big companies running hundreds of containers, okay? Um, if you want to double that, you just use an M4 extra large that has 16 gigabytes of memory. You can have up to, uh, easily 32 containers running, uh, running without any, any, any problem. So, the number, this is the really important part. Number, if we, took, if we take two C4 large, two M3 medium, one M4 large, we add 16 gigabytes of storage in S3. We add uh, about 50 gigabytes per month of uh, Elastic Load Balancer, and we add a 10 gigabytes uh, of RDS, and, and a 10 gigabytes is a lot for Cloud Foundry, really. 10 gigabytes is like a huge amount. This, with this approach, we can get to USD 400, and Khaleesi said that it's okay. Um, so the cool thing about this is that uh, you can actually shrink it just a little bit more. How do you do it? Instead of using um, uh, a C4 large, you use uh, one M3 medium, three T2 mediums, and one M4 large for the runner. This, with eight gigabytes of storage in S3, uh, 25 gigabytes a month uh, on ELB, and five gigabytes on, an RD, on RDS, you can have it for 300, and Chuck Norris says it's okay. So that's fantastic. Um, so this little exercise, okay, shows us that we can have, like, instead of a huge 18, instances, Cloud Foundry deployment, we can shrink it to five, actually. We can cut 
up to 75% of the cost of the original cost. And Dumbledore is really parting hard because he's really happy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is actually a very quick exercise. This talk is not long, um, and I really want to have your questions. Who's, who, who's, who has some questions? Nobody? Okay, that's true. Okay, hey. Looking at the, the implications of running it on GCP with their like per minute pricing and the extra bits like that. The actually, actually no. I would love. Actually, it's it's one of the things that um, I wanted to do afterwards. What I'm going to do afterwards is um, with my company, we're going to develop um, a small uh, Terraform script with a Bosch manifest that actually will provide this uh, deployment in AWS. So what we wanted to do, we want to deploy uh, the same um, uh, configuration in Azure, the same configuration in, in GCP, and um, we want to stress test it. We want to know what are the limitations of it. We have, it, uh, we have done this for uh, small um, development groups, right? But they didn't do any kind of stress testing, but we want to do it. We want to know how much uh, how much uh, pounding can uh, Cloud Foundry resist in different uh, um, infrastructure as a service providers on this configuration? That's what we want to do. Uh, actually, I, I tried to make it before uh, the conference because I wanted to have it ready, but uh, uh, work constraints uh, were impossible for me. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a very interesting exercise. Just uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm going to be uh, posting the results of this uh, exercise because I, I really do believe that is um, Cloud Foundry is much more accessible than people think. I mean, so so much, so many times, it's like, oh, Cloud Foundry, yeah, only big companies use that. Okay, no, it's not only big companies. You have so many options. And maybe choosing your right, uh, your infrastructure as a service uh, correctly can help you, you know, cut costs and whatever. So uh, I don't have the same exercise for uh, GCP, but we're going to do it, actually. We're going to do it. No problem. Any other questions? Yes, absolutely. That's the thing. Um, and this is the principle that I, that I pointed out before. It's very easy to grow. It's extremely easy to grow. You can, um, let's go back just a little bit. Dumbledore parting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. With the help of Bosch, actually, you could, uh, instead of collocating jobs, you can say that uh, one job belongs to only one virtual machine. So let's say that you start having uh, lots of traffic into your application, right? So the first component that is going to be affected is the router. The Go router is the first component that's going to be affected. So very easily, you can change your Bosch manifest to uh, have the router on its own virtual machine. You can redeploy, and you're going to be having uh, your router uh, working in a, a single virtual machine. This is the, uh, the one of the key elements of this configuration. You can scale very easily. You can scale very easily. But what happens uh, if you have to shrink? Shrinking is so much complicated. Uh, every, everybody who works with auto-scaling knows that creating new instances is very easy, but how do you shrink it back? What are, what are the uh, constraints? Uh, how do I re reroute the traffic? How do I work with that? So this principle, stay small until you can't, is extremely important. It's extremely important, both for business and for application development. Uh, so yes, you can scale it very easily. Very easily. Questions, questions, questions? Who else? Nothing else? OK, nice. So I have been over very clear or too confusing. <laughs> OK, oh, there, sorry. I did. I, I, I actually did. Um, the thing is that Diego right now is, is not... Um, lots of people know this configuration, right? And Diego is kind of a newcomer, and you still have to install it uh, separately, and um, it's bigger. Uh, you have 
even more uh, jobs and, and processes running. So I wanted to, to keep it as simple as possible. And many, uh, lots of people are is familiar with this configuration. So that was the rationale bef uh, uh, before this. But what we are going to do in the company, we're actually going to take uh, uh, Cloud Foundry even with Diego, and we're going to uh, apply the same rational process uh, behind this approach. So we're going to do the exercise with Diego too. Uh, that's going to be very interesting, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, I consider Diego, but uh, since uh, Cloud Foundry has been working for so long with uh, this configuration, for me, it was like more familiar uh, to work with this configuration, and, and that pretty much everybody will, will know what I'm talking about instead of talking Diego, Diego Brain, and you know uh, all the components. But yes, I consider that. I consider that. Cool. Anybody else? Okay, sir. Is the recipe for all of this somewhere available on the internet? Uh, not yet. Not yet, but in our company, we're working on, on actually doing this and, and open source it. Uh, we're going to open source a Terraform script to create all the resources in AWS um, with a bootstrap that will uh, create the Cloud Foundry deployment and the uh, Bosch uh, manifest and the um, um, uh, deployment manifest with this configuration. It's not yet, but it will. Uh, good question. Um, actually, I don't really know. Uh, it all depends on, on, on our availability. But I think that mm, uh, before the end of October, we'll have everything ready. That's, uh, we, we'll have that ready. The next step for us is going to be, like I was telling before, stress test it. See how much it can it take. But yes, I, I will make it available. I will make it available. Just follow me on Twitter. Uh, this is the thingy here. Uh, it's not easy, but it's my nickname. Um, probably if I go to the start of the presentation, it's going to be. Uh, wow, takes time. Okay, so that's my my nickname on Twitter. Um, but yes, we will make it available. Absolutely, we are very interested in in, in in people to be able to deploy Cloud Foundry in, in in a small environment. Of course, I mean, if you are going to develop on your uh, computer in a very very small uh, environment, you have PCF PCF Dev. Uh, PCF Dev is absolutely fantastic, but it's only if you're working in your uh, um, on your computer, and you cannot install many more services. So, but PCF Dev is absolutely fantastic. I love it. I, I have it. I use it. Um, but this is for most, mostly for teams that are working together on on the same uh, on the same environment. Any other questions? I think that we are we are up with the time, right? We're we're pretty much done. <laughs> Wrapping up. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right, so thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. See you next year.